Hi, and welcome to the 57th episode of the Machine Ethics Podcast. This month, we're chatting with Stephen Umbrello at the University of Turin. We briefly talk about transhumanism. We then talk about Stephen's passion for philosophy and its practical applications, values at play and value-sensitive design, how technologies co-construct society, integrating VSD or value-sensitive design using agile workflows, the issues of principles, moral imagination, taking abstract principles to design requirements, and renaming AI. To find more episodes, go to machine-ethics.net or you can contact us at hello at machine-ethics.net. You can follow us on Twitter, machine underscore ethics, or Instagram, machine ethics podcast. If you're able, please support us at patreon.com forward slash machine ethics. This is our second episode focusing on design. You can also find episode 55 with Phil Balactas. Thanks very much and hope you enjoy. So, hi Stephen, thanks very much for coming on the podcast. Um, if you'd like to briefly introduce yourself, who you are and what do you do? Sure, no, thanks for the invite. So, uh, first and foremost, I'm the Managing Director at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, which is a think tank, an international think tank, but it's a 501c3 based out of Boston. Uh, and it's a techno progressive think tank. Uh, I'm also um, an ethics expert at Ethical Intelligence Associates, as well as a researcher at the University of Turin, which is in North Italy in the Department of Philosophy. And my main research domain is studying value sensitive design, um, how we can incorporate or design for human values, so innovations for human values. And in particular, my, my research domain focuses primarily on Industry 4.0 technologies, as well as autonomous military technologies. Wow. So I think there's, there's lots of things that we can kind of unpack there. What's a, prog- a techno-progressive think tank to start with? Yeah, so uh, I guess you can say what are the, the traditional progressive values, right, which te- mm. te- typically are, are shifted towards on the left end of the spectrum. But techno-progressivism essentially puts forward the idea that technologies, uh, if distributed equitably, right, and made accessible, uh, can help push forward those progressive values so to increase human flourishing and accessibility and, and equality and so on. Uh, in uh, Industry 4.0, so what we would call the the fourth industrial revolution, right? right? So, you know, we have the steam power, then we have the, eventually the age of uh, information, right, which we kind of find ourselves in right now. Mm-hmm. But what, what differentiates Industry 4.0, and even some people are start, starting to talk about Industry 5.0, right? We're not even in Industry 4.0 yet, is really this type of symbiosis between human operators, right? And technologies mm-hmm. themselves. So rather this, rather than the concept of technological unemployment, which is a real phenomenon, right? Uh, it's kind of how can we design these technologies to actually be symbiotic with human operators on the ground to increase not only their physical capacities, things like exoskeletons to help them lift heavier things, right? But mm-hmm. also their cognitive capacities, right? And sensorial capacities using AR and VR, right? And um, mm. haptic feedback technologies and so on. So how can these operators like within manufacturing environments, right? Uh, work symbiotically with these uh, robotic process automa- uh, automation technologies to actually increase productivity while also not sidelining operators or human well-being. Right. And, and do you think that I feel like there, there might be a a spectrum towards, you know, when you're talking about symbiosis and then maybe some sort of kind of uh, human and um, more transhumanist sort of view on things where we're starting to use these types of technologies to make us different and other and and extend what is uh, possible in in biology for us is that is that something um, which is on that kind of spectrum or is that some sidelined essentially by that well i guess the transhumanists would say that given Mm. that they have the ultimate goal right the the philosophy itself of transhumanism is to arrive at the transhuman or their version of post-human so it's Mm. uh, you know transhuman is kind of the um, the gateway, the uh, the road towards their version of the post-human, which you know the, 
transhumanism is not a monolith either, right? So th yeah. there's many versions of transhumanism. But you can see how r right now when we're talking about Industry 4.0, we're not directly talking about too much direct bodily integration of these technologies, but rather mm -hmm. kind of prostheses, right? These things are extension of the human itself rather than an integral part of the human. Of course, there's the things like microchips and so on, which are directly put into the body to monitor things like health statistics, right, mm -hmm. and metrics. Um, but aside from that, it's mostly these prosthetic devices which extend our our already existing abilities. Yeah, I, I think that's. I think that you could quite easily go down that road and find that it's it's starting to become unclear. You know, whether what is a prosthesis and what isn't. Uh, Definitely, but, yeah. So yeah. Th there's the the problem of ambiguity, right? Mm. Is there really is no the, the threshold is a is a is one that moves back and forth, right? Depending yeah. on who you speak to. So yeah. yeah, there's no clear cut. That's for sure. So. Let's step back for a second and ask the question we always ask on the podcast. Mm -hmm. um, so, Stephen, um, what is AI? And um, mm. I guess what is the kind of the, the crux of what you're really excited about in, in, in this area? Sure. So I think that the question itself is excellent. And I think perhaps it stems from the fact that there is no general acceptance, right? And there's no consensus on what is artificial intelligence. And I think primarily... That comes from the fact of a disconnect between popular understandings of artificial intelligence and then the more academic understanding of artificial intelligence. So we're using the same word to talk about different things, right? Mm. The popular media media tends to talk about the uh, strong artificial intelligence when they use the term artificial intelligence. So we're talking about things directly comparable to self-aware or conscious human beings, right? Whereas in the academic sphere, although, of course, there is a section of academia which directly talks about strong AI, but they're very clear mm. when they're using the term artificial intelligence to preface it with either strong or super intelligent or general intelligence. And then the academic more moderate or weak sense of artificial intelligence. So I think that's one of the main disconnects. When I talk about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, I would talk about a class of technologies that are autonomous, interactive, adaptive, and can carry out human-like tasks. So in particular, uh, I'm interested in technologies that are based on machine learning, which allow these technologies to learn on the basis of interaction with and feedback from its environment. Oh, great. That's a really good unpacking. Thank you. Um, you've, you've spent a long time, um, it would seem, in academia working on uh, philosophy and uh, moving closer towards philosophy of technology and 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 now more into also kind of design of technology as well um i was just wondering what what started you on that journey why why philosophy and, and why mm. is it still interesting for you now so philosophy wasn't uh something uh that i had an intention of taking uh, i kind of stumbled into philosophy right mm. i actually told this story on uh on another podcast where uh, because I went to a uh, Catholic high school, uh, religion is mandatory up until your final 12th grade. Uh, but in the 12th grade, you have a choice, uh, philosophy or religion. Uh, everyone told me, don't take philosophy. It's really hard. Uh, just take the religion. It's a bird course, right? It's like, okay, I go, you know what? No, let me change things up a bit. I'll take the philosophy course. Fell in love instantly. We read things like uh, Sophie's World. We started with the pre-Socratics all the way to the Socratics, to early modern philosophy. Uh, and then modern philosophy, uh, contemporary philosophy. Uh, from then on, I just took it throughout university, really grew a passion for it. Although I was in the analytic tradition, I never was really exposed to the continental tradition of philosophy. I was later introduced to it kind of on my own, but in my master's and mm. other postgraduate studies. I kind of um, stumbled from philosophy because I, although I loved philosophy, I saw it as part of personal transformation and growth right, for understanding the world, mm. I found uh, a difficulty in its applied side. It's how can we really put this into the day-to-day -day lives of people, right? How, how does this really influence that? And because technology is so um, uh, pervasive in society, it's almost, you can't really understand humanity without understanding technology. Mm. Uh, it's how can we apply this directly? And I stumbled onto a MOOC at that time from offered by Delft, which was on responsible innovation and value-sensitive design, which... I would say is directly responsible for value-sensitive design, this design approach 
being the primary vector for my research and my, the way I approach technology, how I frame technology, which is how do we design technologies for human values rather than sidelining human values to kind of like an after the fact consideration. Yeah. And, and, and that, that work's coming through at the moment. And that's, uh, can you give us a definition of what value sensitive design or VSD is for you? Yeah. So value sensitive design is, a, is, a, is often described as a principled approach to take values of ethical importance into account in the design of new technologies. The original approach was developed by Batya Friedman and her colleagues at the University of Washington, but now the approach is more widely adopted and has been developed further by others. And it's sometimes under different headings like uh, values at play or design for values. And the core of val the value sense of design approach uh, is what's called the tripartite methodology, which means three parts, uh, the empirical part, the conceptual part, and the technical part or investigations. Um, as they're often described. And these investigations are, uh, can be carried out consecutively, in parallel, or iteratively. And um, essentially, empirical investigations involved, uh, involve taking into account who the relevant stakeholders are, what are their values and their value understandings and priorities. Conceptual investigations look into the values and possible value trade-offs, right, or value tensions, and technical investigations look into um, value issues raised by current technology and the possible implementation of values into new designs and how those the architecture of systems them itself either supports or constrains certain values simply by the way it's built. Yeah. And do they, when you have those three parts... Is it like a jigsaw puzzle when you have to kind of bring them together somehow and there's a Yeah, because in many times in carrying out one or another, it will require you to go back to reevaluate some of the findings or the way you define certain values or mm. design requirements in previous stages. So it, because it's iterative, it's meant to be cyclical and there could be many things that can trigger a new iteration of that design cycle. Mm -hmm. And I guess... For me, because I, I did a bit of reading of, of some of this work uh, that you put out and um, some of the original uh, value chain stuff, um, value to uh, specification, um, mm -hmm. which one of your um, colleagues put together, I think. And I found it really interesting and, and really useful for some of the work I'm putting together um, at the moment. It, it kind of leads us back to kind of, we almost have to define what is relevant for our definition of value as well. So what... What does a value look like in that sort of um, instance? Yeah, so over the course of value sensitive designs near 30 year history now, uh, values have always been roughly defined as what is important to, uh, to a person or to a group of people. But it has since taken on a more, um, I guess you would say imperative or moral approach. Which, so now you would define values within value sensitive design as what is important to a person or to a group of people, particularly those, uh, those with moral or ethical uh, relevance, right? Mm -hmm. And value sensitive design, although has in the past given a list of certain values that are of importance, they're mostly values that were, uh, that emerged within a particular field, that being mostly uh, human computer interaction. Value sense of design doesn't really say here are the values that are of importance. They say that the, the, the values that are of importance emerge as a practice of the investigator, of the mm. designer, not only through looking at the relevant philosophical literature on the technology we're looking at, but of course through those stakeholder elicitations. So it's, it's, it's a function of co-design, of co-creation the emerging yeah. values. And of course, many of these values of moral importance may come, may emerge after the deployment of a technology. And this is particularly relevant to artificial intelligence whose effects, particularly effects of more opaque machine learning systems are unforeseen or even unforeseeable prior to it being deployed in the field, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And does this approach um, kind of sit nicely with other kind of terms that you might use in design world, so like um, human-centered design or design thinking and these other kinds of things? How, how do those things work together, do you think? Yeah, so value-sensitive design, uh, I think, at its inception was uh, somewhat marketed or discussed as a novel design methodology, but has since 
become more of an umbrella term to describe various approaches to design, so ways of understanding design. So although there is this tripartite methodology, value-sensitive design is essentially, uh, you can say, constituted from, as of today, more than mm. 17 different approaches. Participatory design, universal design, right? Uh, like I mentioned, new terms like uh, values at play or designing for values, right? Human-centered mm. design. I think that these are all ways of understanding certain aspects of value-sensitive design. And value-sensitive design is kind of this modular approach that takes in new information as things come. And it draws from things like the social sciences, right? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. In terms of how can we more saliently design by stakeholder elicitation. So as the social sciences evolve and find out new ways of eliciting stakeholders, right? Of mm -hmm. de-biasing stakeholder elicitations, value sensitive design in turn adopts those approaches, right? So it's not also not a monolith. It's constantly yeah. evolving, constantly integrating other approaches that model themselves as something unique or original. So value sensitive design is actually meant for that. And maybe we can discuss later, I argue that value sensitive design could be used as a toolkit for agile workflows, right? And that's mostly because value sensitive design has been always marketed as an approach that could be integrated into the existing practices of designers because May, maybe you can speak to mm. this, maybe most designers would be a little bit more reluctant or pushback to a wholesale uh, redesign of their day-to-day -day practices. If, if, you, if you argue that, yes, values have to be taken into account, use value-sensitive design, and if value-sensitive design is marketed as an approach that you know kind of supersedes or displaces your current day-to-day -day practices, you'll be more reluctant. If not, you'll just push back entirely. Mm -hmm. But value-sensitive design has always been uh, marketed as an approach that's meant to be integrated into the day-to-day -day practices and modulated there, therefore. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that's, uh, I, as a designer, uh, or uh, having spent a lot of time doing design work as well, um, I feel like in a similar way that Agile often gets used and remixed, you know, for the purposes of the institution and how they work and their processes. I mean, in a similar way, you could just say, I've learned a lot of interesting things from value sensitive design and I'm going to put together this way of working which makes more sense out of my practice or like our team and how that will work and and you might borrow some things from over here and you might borrow some things from over here and it might not be that they call it value sensitive design in practice but they might call it this is how you know this is how our team operates or whatever so I guess uh, it's all about learning and what works and um, a lot of your work is actually feeding back into that loop right uh, you know uh, like you're saying with the agile workflows like how can we um, do some work in practice and then feedback and, and see what works and what doesn't work uh, using these sorts of different tools so did you want to talk briefly about um, your thoughts about the kind of the workflow and agile uh... sure yeah so um, value sensitive design at its core takes uh, the social technicity of technologies as a fundamental precept of, it, of its approach. And what does that mean? That means that uh, technologies are socio-technical, which means that not they do not purely determine society, right? That's a deterministic approach to technology, right? Nor are they purely socially constructed, but they're interactional, which means that they co-construct society. So technologies construct or determine certain paths towards future outcomes, but also society, society and societal pressures and design choices also therefore determine the choices made towards those certain paths. So there's this kind of flow, a dynamism in value-sensitive design and the way it views technologies as being interactional. But if value-sensitive design aims to obtain true equifinalities, that meaning symbiosis in which a particular system or technology forms a part, because we have to remember that, there's this entire systems thinking approach. Uh, technologies don't aren't in isolation. They are co-constructed, right? That means divo divorcing the approach, value sense of design, from the different levels of the wider structural uh, structure, like managerial domains, uh, and uh, and can rather than confining it primarily to the levels of desi designers themselves, just as the you know the workhorses does a disservice. So up until this point, value-sensitive design has been applied and explored by designers themselves who have generally sought to explore its applicability and its strengths. 
but uh, its successes and its methodological aptitude, right, given these last 30 years of it's been applied post hoc to certain technologies, like what if value sensitive design was applied to this technology, right? What would have happened? In designing for these human values, I think entitles it for larger scale adoption. But in order to promote it, we need to look at, you know, like an instance that couples these various levels of abstraction, like managerial and executive levels with the design levels um, and illustrate how VSD works in both directions. So not just bottom up, but also top down. And I think that agile can be used as a vehicle for, for the integration of VSD. So a vehicle for values. And that's because agile practices call for these collaborative, cross-functional and self-organizing teams that rely on managerial levels to choose which work to be prioritized while the designer levels organize around those tasks. And this enables co-construction of the overall project, uh, which, you know, bringing in both the bottom up and the top down application of a central project vision. And the result is a technology developed by all levels. So this is, a, once again, systems within systems, right? Uh, and Agile creates an internal organizational environment that is otherwise lacking in value-sensitive design and provides a landscape on which value-sensitive design can be modulated. So I think Agile is one of these many ways that that can be accomplished, and it's not exclusive to Agile, and value-sensitive design marketed itself since 30 years ago, since the early 90s, as not being exclusive to any one domain, but can be applied to any domain, right, and modulated after its adoption. That, that's super interesting. Um, I had a thought about, in our um, AI ethics world um, that we talk mm -hmm. a lot about on the podcast, um, there was this kind of flurry of... Um, of activity to produce principles of AI um, a couple of years ago. And I was wondering what your thinking of, of the kind of dichotomy between principles or the idea of these kind of top-down approaches and, you know, this work that you're doing in uh, value-sensitive design and, and how they differ and, and, and what's the kind of, kind of point of contention there. So I think, obviously, the exploration of principles uh, is important. It's not the be-all, nor is it the end-all of the question. And I think that one of the issues with exploring principles and various institutes and organizations kind of proposing their own um, risks, and I think today shows it to be the case, has diluted the waters and confused the actual people who do the legwork, the designers, right? And I think, and in my experience in speaking with designers directly, they're almost always in agreement. They always say, yes, we agree with you. We want to design for accessibility, accountability, responsibility, sustainability, right? Mm -hmm. uh, privacy, security. Now what? Right? It's like we agree with the principles, yeah. but now what? We don't have a way forward. What do I do when I go to work tomorrow? How can I actually begin, right? So there's a disconnect. We have what is often high-level abstract principles and they have definitions, right, of what they mean, but they don't include the, how do we translate these abstract principles into concrete, tangible design requirements? So my work uh, coming from value-sensitive design is how can we actually do this translation, right? Uh, in a paper I recently published with Ibo Vanderpol from TU Delft is we try to answer that question. We go, there's this whole host of, you know, high-level principles. But these high-level principles remain overly abstract for designers. They, it's kind of the language of philosophers. But there are existing tools for translating these high-level principles, right? We argue that, you know, there's multiple levels of abstraction here. So we have many sources of values, right? Value sense of design has these huge list of values. We have all these AI ethics values. But we also have even higher level values, like, for example, the Sustainable Development Goals by the United Nations, right? Which we could arguably say the development of AI, which has global implications, falls directly within these more even higher level goals. Mm. So we say there's, there's different levels of goals, even within the high level. And they're not mutually exclusive. Maybe they're even complementary, okay? So we can take these high level, let's say UN goals as the highest level goals. We, this is the goals to be promoted as much as possible, right? Mm. But then we have constraining goals, right? These are still high level, but constraining goals. And we can say that may be like the high level expert group on AI. These are the high level, but they're the constraining goals, right? 
to be, uh, they, they kind of must be promoted, right? Or they must be designed for. We must design for these. Whereas the sustainable development goals, we must promote as much as possible within, within reason. Okay, so we still, we have these high level goals, but we need a, a kind of a bridge between high level goals and the actual tangible design requirements. And we, we argue that these would be norms, right? And within the AI community in particular, we do have these norms. Recently, Luciano Floridian and his group at the Oxford Institute have the AI for social good factors, they call them. And it's a list of seven factors that are actually already um, written, described in, in a normative fashion. Designers should do this. Designers should avoid doing that. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it already gives kind of the constraining norms, that's why they're called that, for the designers. What to do, what not to do. If you, and using that, you can actually translate, right, as what to be promoted, what to be constraining through those norms into design requirements that you can quickly check, satisfy those norms or whether they, you know, uh, are recalcitrant based on those norms. Mm -hmm. So we already have some of these principles that we can, we can adopt any of those principles and the norms which constrain those principles, right, into design requirements. Now, of course, it's, then there comes the question of which set of norm, uh, which set of values do we even choose from, right? And I think that in many cases, these values overlap significantly and we're playing semantic games, right? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, now we, we use the term explicability a little bit more often than transparency because we realize that transparency is not an end in and of itself, but could be more of a means to an end because transparency as a goal doesn't really say much about what you're being transparent about. You could be transparent about huge data sets doesn't mean as a designer, you actually understand what those data sets say. Right, so it kind of uh, it may lack its value. So it's a means to an end towards maybe a more encompassing goal like explicability, which requires transparency, but also understanding, right? And also understanding for whom. My understanding as a philosopher and your understanding as a designer are very, very different. So you require maybe perhaps even con uh, receiver contextualized explanation, right? So depending on who the receiver is, who the user is, uh, the explanation will differ. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think there's a, there's a risk and I think there has been confusion, right? I think what the work should be now is kind of uh, creating a standard, right? At least, and remember, progress, not perfection. We're not aiming for perfection. We're aiming for progress. And that means uh, work over time in order to uh, arrive at greater symbiosis, right? At greater equifinality, even with these principles. And that will require making mistakes. Yeah. So the, the work... Uh, at the Oxford Institute um, with Floridi and, and co-creators, that that could turn into, you know, some of the things that go into the standard, which would comprise of um, not context-specific items, but things that are generalized to not that kind of principle level, but like a level down, you're saying. And it's almost like not a checklist, but like a way of doing things given, you know, a specific, not a specific, but like this kind of thing happening, then you should probably kind of think of this thing or like act in this way. Um, and it's not like a uh, prescriptive thing that you always have to do, but it, it maybe prompts a designer to then make a solution or make a mitigation technique or uh, make a way of working that then uh, complements um, these norms. Is, is that sort of the how I'm extracting that information out of you there. Yeah, I think so. And I think most of it is how can designers continue doing what they're used to doing, like uh, this long tradition, I guess you can say, of day-to-day -day design practices, mm. right? That, do that doesn't displace most of what they're doing or requiring extreme specialist knowledge beyond their domain, right? But that still allows us to arrive at the socially desirable ends, which is how do we design these technologies to respect uh, and promote human values, right? Mm -hmm. From the mm -hmm. beginning, early on and throughout the design phase, rather than designing them ex post facto or always waiting for the egregious mistakes or recalcitrance to actually come up before we, um, before we address them. And that comes both technology, in particular, nuclear energy, right? Mm -hmm. So a nuclear energy, yes, has, you could say, potentially beneficial, clean, 
clean in what term, right? Uh, yeah. Across what time scales is it clean? It's clean today. But simply by the fact that we decided, we, we chose to use this technology today, and we are, mm. we have condemned 10 generations to the management of its waste, right? Yeah. With potentially deleterious consequences. I, I read a, an article and you know you could fact check me on this that uh, Japan has uh, really no place to put the Fukushima waste, right? And has decided to start dumping it into the ocean. Okay, so that's that's the consequences of short termism. Yeah. Short term thinking, right? And artificial intelligence uh, and moving towards AGI in particular, but it doesn't have to be AGI. We could even think mm -hmm. about things like super fast trading algorithms, right? Yep. Which, you know, in 2011 crashed the market and they had to block it instantly and they didn't even really understand why it did what it did, right? So aside from entire economic collapse, uh, things like AGI or its influence within the military domain, right, may have consequences that far outweigh those of even things like nuclear energy far into the future. So the design choices of today definitely affect multiple generations. Mm. Well, that's a really good point. Um, I, I read in, um, I saw in some of your uh, materials that you'd written about moral imagination. And I was just really keen on, on understanding what that was. Yeah, so moral imagination is essentially what I would call authentic morality or what actually human morality is. Mm -hmm. I think we have a tendency when we talk about morality, we automatically move into analytic moral philosophy. And we tend to use the buzzwords of deontology, virtue ethics, and consequentialism, right? Or utilitarianism. Yeah. Sure. Um, and aside from virtue ethics aside, because that's actually a unique one, and I, I, I'm more partisan towards virtue ethics, because I think that is more, there's more of a moral imagination within virtue ethics, is that the other ones tend to be what we would call moral law theories. They kind of say what is right and what is wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Like a priori, before the situation happens. It's kind of a machine thinking in a certain sense. Humans don't really moralize in that way. Real morality is not the trolley problem, right? That's not real morality. That's a sterile, um, uh, prototypical yeah. understanding of morality. Real morality is on the ground, day to day, the way you treat other people, right? How you react to them on the street. That's human morality. And that requires uh, certain cognitive structures, right? That machines don't have right now. And Part of that is imagination. It's empathy, which means projecting oneself into somebody else. That requires creativity. That requires imagination, right? Mm -hmm. Within the des design domain, it has also another implication. It is this long-termism. It's thinking about how will this technology affect uh, generations into the future, non-existing generations, stakeholders that are non-humans. What does that mean? That means taking responsibility for the responsibility of others, right? That's, mm -hmm. a, that's a, a big pill to swallow, right? It's because I'm not just thinking about the economic values of today, but I'm thinking about the social values of tomorrow, maybe values that are non-existent because values do change over time also, right? So we're also designing for flexibility, right? Plasticity, modularity. It's We know that these technologies form the scaffolding for future technology. So the design choices of th today support and constrain not only which values, but also the design choices that are open to us tomorrow, right? So if I think long-term, if I'm thinking multi-generational, I'm also thinking about modularity that is allows for an opening up of potential values that, I, that are unforeseen or unforeseeable today to be at least um, adoptable in today's technology tomorrow. Mm -mm -mm. Um, awesome. I, I love that idea of uh, kind of a different kind of meta almost, or a different abstraction of how we... It's definitely a meta way of thinking, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, it's thinking in systems, right? It's not thinking in isolation. It's mm. not thinking about just this machine learning system right here. You can't separate technology from the societal structures in which it finds itself, in which mm -hmm. it's situated. And things like artificial intelligence are pervasive, right? They break boundaries. Geography is no longer a constraining factor. So we're thinking cross-culturally, cross-socially. 
values. Uh, uh, you're talking about a single technology across a domain of many different values that may also be in tension with one another and then across generations, right? So that's why modularity is important. Full life cycle monitoring, also important. It's not just we design something, we throw it out into the world, you know, and let those values emerge or change over time. And then we have to scramble to bring it back into into the domain of design to try to fix it, right? Yep. Life, full life cycle monitoring should be part of this type of design thinking for multi-generations, right? Is how can we monitor it, not only in the early phases, not only in the prototype phases, but also post-deployment. So that if something emerges that may be an unforeseen value or it disembodies a value or embodies a disvalue, how can we bring it right back into the design domain, right? And do another reiteration, right? Another iteration of design. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I had this. Um, uh, I had this thought about whether the values of the team that is creating the product is part of that tripartite situation, um, because obviously you have this incoming set of norms which might be or values or however we want to talk about it um, which are organizational uh, which is like the culture of the organization or maybe the top down kind of principles of the organization and you have these individuals which are like literally building stuff as well and how that plays into um, the kind of value sensitive design work yeah, so like I mentioned, value-sensitive design is fundamentally predicated uh, uh, throughout its entire tripartite structure on eliciting and uh, co-creating with stakeholders. Value-sensitive design uh, di differentiates between two types of stakeholder groups, direct stakeholders and indirect stakeholders. Direct stakeholders are typically understood as those who are interact directly with and are impacted directly by the technology. Whereas indirect stakeholders, like the name suggests, are those who are only peripherally or ancillarily uh, affected and uh, interact directly or uh, with the technology itself. So of course, the user you would call a direct stakeholder, right? But also the designer, they're interacting directly with the technology. Their values are no less important than those who are they also designing for. The executives may be, uh, uh, you can perhaps you're in the gray area of whether you would call them a direct or an indirect stakeholder, but people could be both in certain circumstances, depending on your understanding. But regardless of whether they're direct or indirect, both must be taken into account in design and how their values come into play and how this technology either supports or constrains those values. Here's a good example of an indirect stakeholder, the environment. The environment is definitely an actor, right? Uh, the Anthropocene right? Uh, this concept of the Anthropocene shows that we as humans can no longer uh, cons um, understand ourselves as being separated from what you would call, you know, nature, is that we are fundamentally impacted by and impact the natural world, right? The, the designs of our technologies, right? Uh, regardless of what those technologies are, either high tech or low tech, have a direct impact on the environment and the ecosystem. So, Yes, you can you can say it is a perhaps a direct stakeholder in a certain sense, but it's it's mostly understood as an indirect stakeholder because it's not a user of the technology, right? Although it is nonetheless impacted by it. So we have to think about environmental sustainability. That's one of the values that we should take into account, right? And that's also about long-termism because it may not impact it today. Nuclear energy may not impact the environment today, but it couldn't impact ecosystems that were unthought of tomorrow. Right? Because it's, yes, we're getting the clean energy right now, but the waste has to go somewhere, right? And it will last there for tens of thousands of years. So we automatically, simply by the nature of the choice of using it now, have condemned generations to maintaining that choice tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it, it might be one of those things that, like, you know, you have this framework of working, but then you have, like, um, prescribed values which you might want to you know you could, you could put your own set of values as a starting point for the template you know you're thinking about processes and, and you know what designers do day to day you know you could pull out your okay we've got this new project on um, we've got to look at all our stakeholder analysis stuff we're going to go and do some research and we're going to go look at the technologies which are possible and we've got the starting point right which might be that we have to look into these certain things. And one of those might be the environment, I would suggest, you know. Yeah, that's actually, there's a term in value sense of design for exactly that phenomenon. Mm. It's called values, dams, and flows, 
right? So it's what should damn the, the, the project right from the beginning and what are the flows that must be there, right? So the dam in the rivers. And that's the, the initial values of certain stakeholder groups. For example, the executives say that we cannot go ahead with this unless it has this or a client requires X. That's it. There's no way around it. It must have this or else there's no way forward. So that would be considered, you know, a, a value dam and value flows, right? right? What we cannot have at all, it, it must not have this in it. It cannot have this in it, right? Morally or economically, whatever it may be. Yeah. And then what it must have. So yes, of course, we do have a, a, a starting set of values, right? Of design requirements. Mm. And then we kind of have to modulate the technology in order to balance certain tensions that may arise, right? You know, we hear all the time with technologies, even with AIs, you know, security versus privacy. They're always framed as trade-offs. Yeah. Designers often don't like the trade-off language. You know, this is just bad design, right? You haven't thought it through enough. There's a way to, to not only translate what these can mean, but simply by the act of translation, we can translate those two high-level abstract values into certain design requirements that may even be complementary and actually augment each one of those, right? So we have to also be wary of the language of value trade-offs and more frame them as intentions. And these tensions are often a priori. Now, that doesn't mean we can always satisfy these tensions in design, right? Design is fundamentally limited by things like code or the physical architecture or cost, whatever it may be, right? But we can at least try to uh, open up the domain of exploration for how can we tackle these values by translating them in certain ways that actually make them complementary rather than exclusive. Mm -hmm. um, so we're getting towards the end now. Is there something specific that you want to pull out or uh, something that you might want to talk about which we haven't done so yet? Uh, nothing in, sp uh, in specific, although I would mm -hmm. encourage... Uh, those who are working within values at play, design for values, value sensitive design, whatever language you want to choose is, mm. uh, there's a lot of work within the last 30 years, the last three decades on uh, what's, why is values at play important? But I think we've arrived at a point of saturation where we fundamentally realize that the impacts of these technologies are unignorable and therefore always have always and will always implicate human values, mm. right? And maybe non-human values. Uh, and because of that, we, we should start really looking for ways forward of directly implementing these into existing design practices rather than kind of either implicitly or explicitly resorting to the language of overhauling existing systems. But, and that's because uh, value sense of design as an approach is fundamentally predicated on the philosophy of progress, not perfection, right? That the aim of perfection may overall hinder uh, uh, the progress of 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 a design, if we're, you know, uh, General Patton said uh, a good plan today is better than a perfect plan tomorrow, right? So it's more about action, right? Mm -hmm. It's like taking action now. And I think that's ever more important in a world where things like machine learning systems are being implemented more haphazardly, right? Uh, every day. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think, um, yeah, there's certain domains where this becomes more and more important. Um, like you're saying, things are happening haphazardly, but you know, maybe in uh, the world of computer games or simulation, that's a okay thing. Whereas over here, we've got like you know, infrastructure and military and all sorts of things that has this higher level of kind of. Uh, I think uh, this goes back to your first question: What is AI? And maybe one of the ways forward is instead of using the term AI, is we got to just talk about the specific technology we're talking about, mm. right? We're talking about an autonomous vehicle. We're talking about a surveillance system. We're talking about an autonomous weapon system, right? Uh, and I think that maybe the overgeneralization of the language itself kind of puts us in a murky, in a murky area that makes it really hard to tackle. And that's, of course, one of the issues with general principles, right, is that they're general and mm -hmm. it doesn't really give you an actionable and operationable way forward. I really like that. Uh, that's, that's great. Um, we should do that for sure. Um, so the last question I always ask is yeah. what it really excites you about this area and this technology and what is something which you are scared of or uh, worried about? 
Yeah, so um, I think, you know, where, where lies the problem lies also the solution mm. in a certain way. And of course, where lies the solution lies also the problem, right? <laughs> Vice versa. Uh, like I mentioned already once, um, I, I see certain techno like certain AI technologies, meaning technologies that are employing machine learning and artificial neural networks in particular. Uh, there's definitely problems with it. Things like um, auditing, uh, in, ter in determining how the data sets are biased, for example, that's always going to be an issue, the, the bias of data sets. So, but I, I, I am seeing a language coming from designers themselves who do not have a philosophical background, uh, like an orientation towards debiasing or at least being aware that there is bias not only at one point within the design process, mm -hmm. but across the entirety of the design process. It's not just uh, the, the set itself, but it's even how we collect the data, right? Which could be mm -hmm. biased also. Yep. So it's across the entire spectrum. Uh, I, I, I see one of the biggest issues, and I mentioned it before, is things within uh, the economic domain, and that being within uh, the fast trading algorithms. Not only are they inaccessible, meaning that they are only accessible by a very small few people, a few companies, who already have the vast majority of the resources, which by virtue of having that technology Therefore, they're, uh, thereby make their position even more concrete. Mm. It's you know the Pareto principle, the Pareto distribution. To those who have many, uh, much, everything will be given, and to those who have nothing, everything will be taken away. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, simply, the the cost of the technology makes it accessible to those who already have the resources to buy it, and then by the virtue of buying it, they will have even more because of the advantage that that technology brings. So. I have a fear that when people talk about autonomous weapon systems, killer robots, the Terminator scenario, when they're talking about the dangers of AI, I would say AI is probably already killing people today. And that's because through economic, um, through squeezing the sponge of economies of third world nations by first world nation algorithms, right, that humans barely understand and move at a pace that our brains can never comprehend or even match, um, I think that that's where the worry is. So I'm not talking about mm. don't look at those longer term things. I'm saying, yes, do that. But there's also serious issues today in our use of these technologies, which have been implemented wantonly and haphazardly. Mm -mm -mm. And uh, I just have to dig in there a little bit quickly. Um, so do you think, because obviously if you were, the, my problem with this, uh, the trading aspect is that if you know, traditionally humans would be doing that trading, and like you're saying, that that's less and less the case. And you have these systems which are autonomous and powered by large institutions. But if that wasn't the case, do you think the consequence of m more human activity in trading would still have the same effect, uh, squeezing those um, other economies out? Um, or do you think it's a... Absolutely no doubt, I don't think. Okay. I don't think there's any doubt in that at all. <laughs> I think okay. what well, my point was kind of these are already uh, these technologies will further uh, stratify already right. existing stratifications, further yeah. empowering those who have power and disempowering those who never had any to begin with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it kind of makes that concrete, almost insurmountable, right? The advantage that that would give. Yeah. So it strangles the market. There is no free market, right? That's 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 silly language, right? <laughs> the market is highly determined. Because it's already controlled by the most powerful. Yeah. Well, you almost have to make a, a new market in that case because you're not playing the same game anymore. I, I, I can't. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't even want to speak to a solution to that because I have yep. no idea on okay. how to do that. And like that's that speaks to what why I use the word insurmountable in a certain yeah. sense. I don't want to be defeatist, but uh, I don't have the language or um, the, the background to, to speak to that type of solution. I think that's probably a conversation for another time as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. It's been really a, ple a pleasure and really interesting to talk to you, Stephen, today. Um, how can people find out about you, follow you, read your stuff? Yes, you know, quick Google search, you'll find most of my stuff, my socials. Uh, I'm mostly active on Twitter at Stephen Umbro. Uh, you can find me there. Um, and uh, my university webpage will have most of that stuff, Wikipedia. I'm sure I'm, sure I'm pretty accessible. I just type my name in. Wicked. Thank you so much for your time and um, I'll speak to you soon. I appreciate it. Thanks for the invite. Hi and welcome to the end of the podcast. Thanks again to Stephen Umbrello. He's someone I've been following for quite a while now on Twitter 
and we've read some of his work of him and his colleagues on value sensitive design as it's been feeding into some of the work I've been doing doing consultancy on AI ethics and the process of how you take a idea and take it through this kind of data science process with design and data scientists and project managers and all these sorts of things and we we talked about agile and how you can kind of slot these things together so it's been really useful to actually talk to Stephen and get some more of his insights on on those matters so thanks again if you're able to support the podcast please go to patreon.com forward slash machine ethics and thanks again for listening